And one of the primary entry points of it getting inside your body is via the eyes, by wiping that cold virus on your eyes. There have been several studies now showing when people encounter another person and they shake their hand, they either touch their eyes or touch another region of their face very close to the eyes. Things like intermittent fasting or even longer duration fasts have been implicated in improvements in the function of the innate immune system. Keep our immune system functioning at its best. We want inflammation available as a tool to combat infection. So how do you catch a cold? People generally assume that it is the cold temperatures outside that actually give you a cold virus. And that is simply not true. The virus that we call the cold virus is spread by breathing or by sneezing or by people sneezing or coughing or breathing onto their hands and then touching surfaces and then other people touching those surfaces and then touching most likely their eyes in order to self-infect. The cold virus is a pretty stable virus in that it can survive on surfaces, non-human or human surfaces, meaning skin or on a table or on a glass or on a door handle for up to 24 hours. However, the fact that a cold virus is alive and well on a given surface, let's say on a door handle, does not mean that if you touch that door handle that you will necessarily be infected with that cold virus. And that's because your skin actually provides an excellent barrier against most viruses and bacteria. Your skin also includes a lot of antiviral substances on it. Even if you haven't put any of that, you know, alcohol stuff or the hand sanitizer stuff on, your skin is a very important barrier component of your immune system. So should you touch your hand to a door handle or table, or shake the hand of somebody that has cold virus on their hands, either because they themselves have a cold or they contacted somebody else had cold virus and it somehow landed on their hands, that cold virus will not infect you unless it can get inside of your body. And one of the primary entry points of it getting inside your body is via the eyes, by wiping that cold virus on your eyes. Now you may think, okay, I'm just not gonna touch my eyes. But a little bit later, we're going to talk about a study that shows that almost always, Indeed, almost always, when you meet somebody new, you touch your eyes. And the frequency of people touching their face, that is the region of the face around the eyes and their eyes throughout the day is extremely high. Okay, so now let's talk about the flu virus. The flu virus is, as I mentioned, a virus. And just like with the cold, there are different serotypes of the flu virus. One thing to know, and I consider this a fortunate aspect of flu virus biology, is that the flu virus, unlike the cold virus, can only exist on surfaces for about two hours. After about two hours, it tends to die off. So the flu virus is most typically passed by human-human contact or coming into contact that is walking into a cloud of somebody's sneeze that contains flu virus or somebody's cough that contains flu virus. And yes, it is possible that shaking someone's hand could actually introduce flu virus to your hand. And then if you wipe your eyes, can get into your body and infect you. And yes, you can pick up the flu virus from surfaces. However, that is far less common. Now there aren't as many different types of flu virus as there are types of cold virus. And that's why there have been attempts at making flu vaccines or so-called flu shots. I think most people are familiar with the signs and advertisements online and in the workplace and school saying, you know, get your flu shot this season. So how effective is the flu shot? Studies have shown that getting the flu shot reduces one's risk of contracting the particular flu that is most abundant that season by about 40 to 60%. But of course the flu shot is completely ineffective at combating any other forms of the flu virus and of course colds or other types of upper respiratory infections. Studies have also shown that taking the flu shot can reduce the severity of one's symptoms if they in fact get the flu anyway. Okay, so before I talk about the important roles of the innate and the adaptive immune system in keeping colds and flus at bay, I'll tell you that you have a problem. And that problem is that you tend to touch your eyes very often. In fact, you tend to touch your eyes most often after you shook somebody else's hand. There have been several studies now, primarily from Noam Sobel's lab at the Weizmann Institute, showing that when people encounter another person and they shake their hand, they either touch their eyes or touch another region of their face very close to the eyes or that they touch their hand to their mouth. 
And when we do this after shaking somebody's hand, that there's a lot of information about the other person's physiology and health, that deep parts of our brain that are involved in primitive type behaviors, but also some pretty sophisticated behaviors are taking into account. The reason I'm bringing up these studies now in the context of colds and flus and how to avoid getting colds and flus is as a reminder that we are pretty much wired to contact our own face with our own hands at the level of our eyes, nose, and upper lip and around the eyes very shortly after we touch somebody else's skin. And if you are mindful of it, you can actually avoid bringing colds or flus to your face. Some conscious awareness of these routes of passage for the cold or flu virus, I do believe can reduce the probability that you will catch a cold or flu. There are many cases, we believe, where you get exposed to a cold or flu, it makes it into your body, but your innate immune system is sufficient to beat it, to fight it back. This is one of the reasons why it's so important that if you're starting to feel a bit under the weather and you think you're coming down with a cold or flu, that you do certain things in order to make sure that your innate immune system is both ready and that it can launch a full-scale attack on that cold or flu virus. We're gonna talk about how to do that a little bit later. I'm not trying to withhold, it's just, it's important to understand that just because the virus makes it into your body doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna get a full-blown cold or flu. And in fact, that innate immune system sometimes is sufficient to prevent that cold or flu from replicating enough that you get the full-blown set of symptoms. What the scientific peer-reviewed research says about how to allow your immune system to function at its best such that you can combat colds and flus. Now, fortunately, there are a lot of different things we can do to improve the function of our immune system. In fact, I feel like anytime the winter months roll around, we start to see the same list of things surface online and in the press. And I don't want to diminish these things. They are, in fact, the bedrock of maintaining and enhancing the function of your innate immune system. So what are those? Well, some of these will be pretty obvious. Things like getting enough quality sleep each night. We know, for instance, that if you're sleep deprived, so especially if you stay up all night, but certainly even if you only get 50% or 75% of your sleep requirement, that your innate immune system is going to suffer. It's not going to be as effective at combating flus or colds. In addition to that, we know that exercise of specific type and specific duration and specific intensity can serve to bolster the innate immune system. We also hear, and it's absolutely true, that we need adequate nutrition. If we are in a caloric deficit, for instance, if we're trying to diet through the winter months, which many people try to do, that can place our innate immune system in a bit of a compromised state. That said, things like intermittent fasting or even longer duration fasts have been implicated in improvements in the function of the innate immune system. However, extended fasts or not eating enough calories to maintain body weight for many, many days in a row can actually compromise the function of the innate immune system. And then of course, we hear about stress, that we're all supposed to regulate our levels of stress, not get too stressed. Yes, indeed, chronic stress, meaning stress that continues day after day after day, or even short periods of stress that impede our ability to sleep at night can indeed reduce the functioning of our innate immune system. However, it's also clear that short bouts of stress, provided that they don't inhibit our ability to sleep that night, can actually enhance the function of the immune system. And this is something that I don't think is talked about enough. You know, we hear so often that, quote unquote, cortisol is bad, it's a stress hormone. Listen, cortisol is fantastic, provided that it is elevated early in the day and not late in the day or evening. Also, cortisol does have thresholds beyond which, if it's too high, it can be bad for us. But it's also the case that if cortisol levels are too low, that's bad for us, and it's especially bad for the functioning of our immune system because glucocorticoids, of which cortisol is, have an important role in activating those natural killer cells of the innate immune system. They are one of the primary signals by which those interleukins, like interleukin-1 and interleukin-6, are deployed in our body. And so very often we'll hear stress increases inflammation. And indeed, interleukin-1, interleukin-6 are pro-inflammatory. You might think, oh my goodness, I don't want that. I don't want cortisol. I don't want these interleukins elevated. But guess what? The inflammation response is also an important component of that innate immune system that allows us to combat infections. So keep our immune system functioning at its best. We want inflammation available as a tool to combat infection. We want cortisol available as a way to activate that inflammation and other aspects of our immune system. We just don't want so much cortisol and so much inflammation that 
we can't sleep, and that our gut microbiome suffers. And that brings me to the other component that's important for the basic functioning of your innate immune system so that you can be at your strongest when you inevitably encounter those cold and flu viruses. That the gut microbiome, which are the trillions of little microbacteria that interact heavily with the immune system and help support the immune system, you wanna keep the gut microbiome healthy.